Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by John Medham, who is the owner and operator of CocktailDrum.com. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, uh, you're a performer as well, as you told me, as a very eclectic um, kinds of music, all kinds of different things, um, some of which involving cocktail drums, of course. So we'll we'll kind of go into that later. But um, this is one of those episodes that I have had multiple people um, request I'd say over the last, probably after the first six months of the show, every once in a while, someone would say like, hey, a, um, a cocktail drum episode would be really cool. But the last one, and I always want to give people a shout out if they recommend an episode on Instagram, Bobby801 is the one who recommended this. So thank you to Bobby. Um, but anyway, John, so why don't we uh, why don't we jump in and maybe start by explaining what a cocktail drum kit is and then teach us the history? Okay. Um, well, the, the current, what I would call the current definition of a cocktail drum usually involves some sort of kit that has a uh, bass drum pedal that strikes upward hmm. and hits the bottom head of a drum. It could be a floor tom or a floor tom, which is a little bit taller than a regular floor tom. They're usually played standing up. And very often there's a snare. It's either a snare mechanism in that single main drum a set of wire brushes that pushes against the top head, or it could be a side snare mounted so that you have a regular snare on the side and the main drum acts as kind of a floor tom when you play the top and a kick drum when you play the bottom. Hmm. I think that's what most people think of when they hear cocktail drum. Yeah. But there is nothing defined. There's no actual definition. It sort of a hodgepodge history of different experiments that people were trying. And uh, even to this day, there's still some variations on that. Different people doing different uh, techniques of, of making these kind of drum kits. Yeah, that's super fascinating. And and I'm I'm interested, and I'm sure we'll get into it, about the 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 kind of technology of having the bass drum, you know, the kind of the long cocktail drum where, you know, the top part is the snare and the bottom part is the bass drum and how that affects the sound. Cause I have never played one. I don't think I've, no, I have, I, I did once or twice. There was a drum store here that I, I taught at where one came in and I played it and it was awesome. But, um, it's definitely, it gets, it takes some getting used to. Um, but absolutely. But before we go there, let's just learn about where these, uh, quirky, <laughs> interesting, instruments um came from sure um well the the earliest reference i have seen to anything remotely resembling a cocktail drum is in a 1931 leedy catalog and they have something that they call a conga tom Hmm. and basically it's a single headed what looks like a floor tom it's a little bit taller and it stands on legs and it's tall enough that you play it standing up uh, in in the description on the product page, it says authentic Latin tone. And I think in the 30s, uh, in the early dance music, kind of leading into the swing music, there is a lot of focus on African rhythms, African drumming, and Latin rhythms and Latin drumming. So I think a lot of these dance band drummers were looking for new sounds, new ways to incorporate the sounds and rhythms into their songs. Yeah. Um, so, so these things, you'll see them in some old pictures where someone will have a kit, you know, the, the big old kit with a 26 inch bass drum, and they might have one of these drums on the side and it's positioned in a way that you can see that they probably stood up and played it. Or you might see a band leader with one standing at the front of the stage. Yeah. So it was a little bit of a show drum as well. Very cool. Yeah. That was the first thing we saw. And I have not seen any, uh, and, and if someone has catalogs out there, please send them to me. Um, the next thing reference that I have seen is in 1948, there's a catalog for the uh, entry for the Carlton King combination. Completely different concept. This is a drum kit that has a 20 inch kick drum or, or Tom, whatever you want to call it, but it's turned on its side so that there's a head facing up and there's a head on the bottom. Now this drum actually has a full timpani tuning mechanism on the inside of it. Hmm. So there's a huge metal bar across the bottom. There's a pedal for doing the pitch up and down like a timpani. 
And there's a kick pedal specifically designed to hit up and hit that bottom head. So that's the first time I've ever seen the upward hitting pedal. Wow. And that yeah. kit also had a snare mount on it. So there's a snare on the side, uh, mounts for lots of auxiliary percussion. You usually see it with bl- wood blocks, which you would see with a lot of the old dance band kits back then. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, apparently these were used in small pit orchestras at, at dance halls and movie theaters and things like that. It was a way of kind of uh, expanding the drummer's uh, uh, vocabulary and sonic palette while still trying to keep it relatively small. Interesting. And Carlton is a British brand, um, yeah. which is kind of cool. So, um, and let's, so people listening, if you go to cocktaildrum.com, and on the left under learn, there's a history tab, and you can actually see a picture of this drum set that he's talking about. But there's a really cool um, uh, article that's by Liam Mulholland from that was from Drum Magazine. But it's just, you know, so you can see some pictures and stuff on the website as we go. Um, which is where I'll be kind of clicking through um, as we talk, but gosh, it's just so fascinating. But it's it's so interesting too because you think like, you know, who was the guy who invented it? You know, where where did it come from? Is it? it it's kind of like one of those things where like people like George Way or something who invented so many little things. Like I, I just wonder who the guy was who um, actually started to flip the drum over, or if it goes back to um, like you said with the African, you know. The, the people wanting to be more in that where if this was something where it was taken from another culture and they said, okay, this is cool. We can do this. And, um, and it's just, it's just interesting to, to piece it all together. Like, like you've done. Yeah. And, and also seeing kind of how these trends kind of come and go, uh, the, the timpani tuner in that, in the, uh, Carlton kick drum, you know, I, I haven't seen any other drums like that until I believe it was in the eighties. Yamaha came out with a Timp Tom floor tom. Hmm. And I believe it was, I only think they made a 14 inch. They may have made a 16 inch as well. And it was the same concept, but it was a floor tom with a tuner on mechanism on the inside and a pedal. It, it didn't hold pitch, but you could go up and down. I remember uh, seeing a video at some point where Billy Cobham was using one. Oh, cool. And it was, again, it was, it was a little bit of a trick, but kind of a fun thing. Again, just trying to expand the palette of what what drummers have in their arsenal. Yeah, really? Wow. So to look at where we're at now, so this is the Carlton is in 1948 and it was designed to be for tight orchestra pits, right? So instead of having this footprint of this drum set spread out, you shrink it and it's kind of like, um, like you're a New York city guy. It's like, okay, we can't build wide. Let's build up, you know? Yep. <laughs> so it's like exactly the skyscraper exactly. of, uh, of drums. So that's pretty yeah. neat. Yeah, we'll come back to that when I tell you about where where and how I found my cocktail drums. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> that comes later. Um, yeah, so the, the next step really, um, again, this is all based on catalogs um, that I have. And all these catalog images are on, on the website as well. Um, 1951 was the year that these things really started coming out. So the, the next thing that really happened was that um, Slingerland came out with a kit they called the Combo Bebop. And this was a kit which had a bass drum and a snare drum, but the bass drum was designed to be used either traditionally Hmm. sitting on the ground with a pedal hitting straight forward, or it had the hardware on it that you could flip it up and have the play the top head. And the pedal actually was convertible. So uh, there uh, Slinger at the time had the Gene Krupa. Everything was Gene yeah, Krupa sure. at, at, at that point. Um, they had the Gene Krupa pedal, and they made that reversible. I actually have one, and it's very easy to disconnect. It's it's a metal piece instead of a strap, but you disconnect that. And you can just flip it over to the other side and hook it in, and suddenly your pedal is hitting up instead of forward. Yeah, jeez. And uh, it was a really cool thing, but the whole idea was adapt to the situation. Here's your one kit. And if you need something where you're playing, say, a timpani part, I'm doing air quotes there, uh, you could flip the bass drum over and have that. Or if you're doing this kind of rhythmic African drumming, you you could play it with sticks, play it with mallets, and, uh, you know, use it for those other purposes or just use it as a regular drum kit. Hmm. Wow. Um, So that's... Go ahead. I'm looking at the... um... 
uh, the catalog page right now, again, on your website. But like, so $127 for the nickel version, $142 for the chrome version, which, I mean, in 51, that's not cheap. And the reversible pedal was uh, $18.50, which it's not super cheap. But this is such a cool technology to be able to just flip your drum. I, I've said this before, but a lot of these old, cool, you know, unique technologies, I always think to myself, like, man, I could see that today. I could see A and F doing that, where you take the bass drum and flip it upright or something, you know? It's just yeah, yeah. so cool. Yeah, uh, it was an interesting thing, and it, it it really went out, you know, completely phased out. Uh, I think that those particular setups phased out by the end of the 50s. Uh, that really wasn't a thing anymore. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a parallel too of the of the day of um, like Lionel Hampton and these guys who were kind of like the front men drummers who would stand there and be it's like a very showmany and and Gene Krupa is in movies and it's just like you know what I mean it's like it it's very theatrical versus sitting down um, yeah yeah well and I'll, I'll point out a couple of things um, the the earliest sighting that I have of what I would call a cocktail drum is in a 1941 movie ball of fire in which gene krupa and his band play and there's a drum on the stage hmm. now it's it, he doesn't play it so i have no idea if it was just a prop yeah or if it was something that he actually performed on but it looks like it's two floor tom shells one on top of the other with a band in the middle there's no legs there's no air gap on the bottom huh. but there is a uh, drum rim on the top oh, cool. so it you know, couldn't really tell. It could have been just a stand for the singer to put their drink on. Yeah. I, I really don't know. You know, his, his band had, uh, you know, every big band had their music stands sure. and his band had music stands that had little drums built into them yep. that he actually would play on some tunes. So everything on his stage was drum oriented, whether it was functional or not. So yeah. As uh, they're performing yeah. drum boogie or something like that. I'm sure yep, I think that's exactly that's what that's from. That's yeah. the song. Yep, drum boogie. Man. Um, yeah. And and the other thing, uh, you mentioned Lionel Hampton. Um, you know, he was famous. You know, he's a vibraphone. He's a good, fantastic drummer as well. And he was famous as part of his show for having a solo on a floor tom. And there are some videos out there where he's playing both the floor tom and this conga tom that I described. Hmm. So he has the two drums and he's going back and forth between the two uh, as part of a solo. That's cool. All right, so we're in the 50s. We're in the early 50s yeah. right now. Um, yeah, so 51. And um, yeah, let's keep going with that because 51 was was a big year for this. So in 51, we had the Slingerland combo that we talked about, the Bebop, the reversible pedal. They also came out with, uh, now it could have come out before this, but this is the catalog that first had it that I know of. Um, Slingerland came out with their own Radio King combo drum, which is that same single-headed tall floor tom like the Conga Tom yeah. that, that was in the Lady Catalog in 1931. But the other thing that is really amazing and cool is that Rogers, in their 1951 catalog, they had an outfit called a Park Lane Cocktail Outfit. So this is the first one that ever called it Cocktail. Hmm. And that was made up of just standard Rogers parts. So it was a 16 by 16 floor tom and a 14 by 5 snare drum or some sorry i'm doing it backwards 5 by 14 snare drum a 9 by 13 tom tom and they had hardware all over the floor tom to hang the snare drum and the tom and a couple of cymbals hmm. off of the floor tom and they had made their own upbeat pedal mechanism that was integrated with one of the legs of the floor tom man so this is like light years ahead of what anybody else was doing at the time. Yeah. And, I'm looking uh, at it now and it is like yeah. it, going from like clicking from the Slingerland catalog with kind of like the conga drum to to this. It was like, whoa, that is a modern cocktail kit right there. Maybe yeah. the floor time would be a little longer, but man, this thing is like beautiful. I mean, but they're still yeah. they're almost pushing 400 bucks. I mean, in the fifties, which is pretty yeah, serious. It's, it's a, it's a full kit. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the, the really significant pieces are that one, the snare was separate from the, the floor Tom. Uh, so, well, it, it's significant kind of in the whole history of it. Um, some of the combo drums did have this snare 
mechanism on the inside, even for the single headed ones. I had a Slingerland that had this. Um, and, you know, it's basically like half of a snare bed that is attached to like a muffler strainer. So you twist the thing to tighten the snares up against the bottom of the top head. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's a weird sound. It's yeah. not, doesn't sound like a regular snare drum. So I think that, you know, they, they figured out that problem by doing this. Sure. Um, the only thing with the park lane is I, I think you would normally have to sit down to play it because it's a regular 16 inch high floor tom. Yeah. So you're, you're not really going to get it up to a plane position uh, unless you're really leaning over to, to play the thing. Yeah. Um, my thought too is like, that is so much weight on oh, yeah. these legs and like everyone, I mean, I've, everyone's had drums from like, even like the nineties or the eighties where like, you're playing, you're playing, you're playing, boom, the wing nut gives out on the floor tom and it slides to one side or like it just falls down. <laughs> this probably yep. has 20 pounds, maybe more of, of stuff. I mean, you'd have to crank this thing down. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, their, their hardware was very, very strong. They're known for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, the one other thing in that same 51 catalog for Rogers is they did offer uh, a set called the showcase outfit which basically was a full drum kit with a 20 inch kick and a 12 and 13 inch tom and 16 inch kick drum and 14 inch snare drum but it included all that hardware on the floor tom and the upward uh hitting kick pedal hmm. so that you could take you could have your full kit if you needed it if you had a small little gig and you wanted the small kit you could just take the pieces that made the park lane outfit wow so it was one of the first kind of uh, modular, a full kit that's designed to be modular and taken apart and used as a smaller kit when you need it. Yeah, and it's uh, it's neat too um, that you have, you know, uh, you can click you you've you've included the various pages that have cocktail related stuff that you can you can buy just the upward, you know, hitting bass drum pedal on its own. Um, how does that? I've never actually really looked at one. How does that technology work? Is it basically just the, it's just flipped? You know what I mean? Like the, the, the spring pulls it up basically. Yeah. I mean, really all, all you really need to do is let, let's just talk strap because that's the easiest thing to, to picture. You know, the strap comes around the front of the pedal. And when you push down on the pedal, it pulls the strap, which pulls the beater forward and into the bass drum head. Well, if you take that strap and go behind the other direction and connect it, when you push down on the pedal, it's going to pull back towards you. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to move the beater so that it's uh, you know below horizontal so that it's going to go up. Got it. And, and hit the bottom head. Interesting. Um, yeah, there, there's actually uh, at least one article on my site for converting... Um, one, I think there's two, actually. I think there's a, a DW conversion article that uh, a friend put together there. And then there's one that I did for just kind of a, a cheap pedal just to show people how, how they can do it. Yeah, that's neat. Um, depending on the pedal, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, it's cool. I love in the Rogers stuff where like looking at the, the one, the page with the showcase outfit, how it's Camco pedals. It's just neat to see, you know, so much different history going on on their... Um, yeah on that so cool okay then where do we go from there yeah so then um four years later 1955 singerland's next catalog has the new in quotes two-headed cocktail drum and this is to me this is the first full-on what what i view as the basic cocktail drum hmm. so it's a in their case it's a 14 inch drum bottom head and a top head sitting on legs like a floor tom but it's 20 i think this one was 24 inches tall and it has the snare the half snare mechanism on the inside and it has an upbeat pedal in 55 they were still using the krupa reversible pedal yeah for that um, and then there's a bracket sort of a u-shaped bracket that connects onto the legs uh, below that you can then clamp down your your bass drum pedal to cool um so again to me that is really that that's the fundamental cocktail drum but people are welcome to to differ yeah if they want. <laughs> now do you put i think i've always wondered this do you put in the cocktail drum 
Um, do you put like a little pillow or anything to muffle on the bottom? It it really depends. Um, I've seen everything from some people put packing peanuts in the drum so that they oh, just cool. rest on top of the bottom head and then they poof, you know, it gives it a little sustain while they float yeah. and come back down. Um, the uh, the Yamaha Club Jordan, which is a modern instrument, a lot of people use zero rings and things like that mm-hmm. on the inside. Uh, of course, you know, now we have all these heads that that have built in muffling. Sure. Um, all the mad uh yeah uh heads and yeah uh, on, on my and, particular yeah. drum so i i mostly play this drum that we're talking about right now the slingerland two-headed cocktail drum 14 inch um that that's my main instrument i have a couple of those and over the wow. years i've had a few few others <laughs> cool um but that that's to me that's the perfect size um ludwig made a lot of 16 inch ones which are just a little too big and flappy and low for for my taste for the music that I've been doing on them. Um, but for mine, I actually spent a long time trying to get the sound right. And you know, it, so I'll take a little detour here. Yeah. Um, you know, the, these ones also do not have any sort of baffling in the middle. Some of the Gretsch ones and some of the Ludwig ones did have an actual baffle in the middle usually up closer to the top so that you'd get this sort of smaller airspace for the snare piece yeah, okay. and a larger airspace for the bass piece. Uh, I think they were just trying to stop the snare rattling when you hit the bass drum uh, because on mine, it's a single column of air. So there's just, there's no way to avoid it. When you hit the kick drum, the snare is going to rattle. Yeah, sure. And and if you put on the same heads, you know, the starting point for most people, coded ambassador and tune them about the same, it sounds great as a single drum but it doesn't really sound like a, a good bass drum or a good snare drum <laughs> and it's very messy you know if you turn the snares on and you hit it it just rings and bzzz, you know yeah it's cool if you're looking for a weird sound effect it's actually very cool and it, it can work for the right thing but i was looking for something which would function a little more just as like a kick and a snare so i ended up putting a power stroke three on the bottom and loading it up with duct tape and paper towels oh, like wow. adding as much mass as i possibly could and tune it down as low as i could while still having a tone i ended up having to put lug locks on it because the lugs would just fall out by the you know halfway through the gig yeah and then the top i would put uh, a diplomat on it you know the thinnest remote sure. head and crank it and by making them very very distinct tunings and head types it really separated out the sound. Um, the diplomat still, if I wanted, if I did a rim shot really close to the edge, you still get some ring. The snare actually sounds really good like that, but the, the kick drum still has a lot of oomph and not, not the loudest kick, but you put a mic on it and it sounds amazing. I, I did a lot of shows where I'd show up, you know, I, I used to tour with it actually um, with a singer songwriter and I would show up and the sound guys would kind of snicker. And then they'd I'd be like, look, trust, trust me, just put some mics on it. And, you know, once, once they put it through the mixer, it, it sounded great. That's so awesome. Got wow. A lot of good feedback on that. Yeah. And it's, um, I just think in general with, with you in modern times and going back to, you know, any time in the fifties, going into the sixties, like it's just unique. Like it makes you stand out. Get it? Cause you're standing. Um, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but on the cocktail <laughs> kit, no. But it, it it's really unique. Um, so would you say that that's more than you know with the Carlton kit in forty eight, where you're in the pit and it's you know space saving? How much of it is you love the sound of it, and not you, but just in general? Versus, it's just a very unique, cool way to play the drums standing up. Do you think? Yeah. Like, is it? Yeah. Well, I, th- I think it's a, it you know sort of different for each person. Um, the thing that I really love about it is I feel like I found my sound on it, and it it is an oh, instrument cool. that you have to work to get the right sound that's going to work for you. You know, I've I've had people come in they're like, oh, cocktail drum, cool, and like rock drummers, and they just stomp on the pedal and they smack the top, and they're like, that sounds horrible. Why would you mm. ever want to do that? And it's not for that. You know, it, it's for very quiet music. Um, you know, again, in New York, singer songwriters playing in a small club, you, you can play in a cafe and actually lay into it 
and it and it feels good and it sounds good and it's not overwhelming um that's cool you know for again like so i i for years i played in this band cocktail angst which you and i were talking about before um really fun band um playing a lot of kind of high energy latin lounge jazz stuff very humorous thing but a a lot of virtuosic stuff in it and when that band started i was just playing a regular drum kit and i found the cocktail drum in at this place uh, out in brooklyn down near coney island um actually this really funny guy uh, anyone who's in brooklyn they might know david covens and he runs this place called the school of musical performance on king's highway in brooklyn and he's been playing drums forever and he just has this space that has rooms and rooms and rooms filled with drums Hmm. and hardware and gear and all this stuff. And he's a really nice guy. And, you know, he had one sitting around and I was, the price was right. I said, okay, you know, gotta have it. Um, I'd seen them before. The first time I ever saw one was uh, Matt Wilson, well-known jazz drummer. He and I were in Boston at the same time and we would play in groups on the the same shows, you know, the course of the night. And I saw him playing with a duo set with Charlie Cole Hayes on the cocktail drum. And I was so fascinated by it and he did such amazing things on it. So it, it always stuck with me. I was like, that's so cool. cool yeah. And when I had the opportunity to get one, I just had to do it. And I just started playing in this band cocktail length. So um, I remember the first time I brought it into rehearsal, I did not know how to tune it. I didn't have it set up. I said, guys, this is a cool thing. Trust me, <laughs> help, help, help me grow through this. Yeah. You know, just put up with this for a while. <laughs> and I just remember after that first rehearsal, everyone was like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. you know, just very, very nonplussed yeah, cool. that I was suddenly doing this weird thing. And, you know, I didn't have an open hi hat and I had one symbol and it all just sounded very clangy. And, um, hmm. but over time, you know, I added a cowbell. I added some Remo kids bongos, which sound amazing with the right sticks. Uh, I found like, just the right symbol, a little twelve-inch symbol, perfect for a crash and ride, and and that became the sound of the band. Cool, you know, that, yeah. That, so it really, really worked out great. But um, you that's know, awesome. I think that's what most people find is they have, they have to really work on it and figure out how it fits in to the music that they play and the way they play the drums and what they want to get out of it. Yeah, man, that's. Uh... That's a great answer because I mean I guess it, it becomes a a part of you and it's just are you more comfortable on a cocktail kit now than like when you sit on a regular drum set? Not I'm sure you were great on a regular drum set too, but do you prefer the cocktail? Yeah, uh, no, <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> uh, no, no, I, I play much more regular kit. I mean, yeah. I I used to gig out several nights a week on the cocktail drum, and you know I I was really in shape on it 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 is tiring because you are largely standing on one leg you know kind of holding up your your bass drum leg again everyone has a different technique yeah for that. um it it can be hard on your leg it can be hard on your back a bit um nice thing with cocktail lengths was i didn't always have to play the bass drum with stuff so if i got tired i could actually kind of dance in place and just play the cowbell on the bongos and the snare and do stuff sure um because we we used to do you know four or five hour nights playing and that's a lot I yeah mean, one set on the cocktail drum is is not hard <laughs> but doing doing long nights of stuff it, it can get exhausting you read my mind on a question there about um i was gonna say are you typically playing these heel down because of the whole balance thing i mean or is it kind of like you said you you're lifting your foot up or your heel you know what i mean like how, how's the yeah. bass drum work yeah well, for the most part, I would say again, I play relatively quiet. Um, you know, I, I feel like I have the sounds right so that at the dynamic that I play, they sound really good and they, they have impact. And if I need reinforcement, I'll just mic them rather than try and play a lot louder. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, you know, my left foot is usually planted on the ground. My right heel is usually down and planted. So that way I have like a nice solid position to play from. Mm-hmm. And then th- on the kick drum, you can actually be very dynamic with it. So if it's just something straightforward, I'll just play heel down. If I need to do a lot of doubles, I can just lift the heel up just enough and just balance back on my other foot. 
and and do that when I need to. Gotcha. But again, it, you you just end up shifting around just to to save yourself the pain <laughs> of of uh, yeah. you know, standing on the one leg. Well, I've, I've actually at times I've I've literally switched feet and played the kick with my left foot man. if if uh, things were getting too painful. I can tell you right now from being in a cast in a boot with the Achilles tendon rupture and having surgery of like totally not drum related, actually the farthest thing from drum related because I can't play the drums right now, but like where you're standing, you're not putting all your weight on one foot. It starts to just kill your other foot and then yeah. you have to shift and it's just so, so I, I, I feel your pain um, with that, but um, all right, let's hop back into the history here, obviously. Um, so I think we were towards the end of the 50s there. So what happens then in, in the 60s? Yeah, so um, 55, I'll just mention that um, Gretsch got into the market as well. They, they came out with a single-headed cocktail drum. They actually called it a cocktail drum also. So obviously sometime in, in the early 50s, someone started calling these things cocktail drums. But Gretsch had offered a single-headed and a double-headed cocktail drum with a pedal. They had their own uh, upbeat pedal mechanism. Hmm. Those ones also came with a, a little tom on the side. So the snare was built in to the main drum, but they did have a little uh, eight-inch tom on the side. Um, so just variations on the same thing. Uh, in 59, uh, cocktail, uh, sorry, Ludwig offered a cocktail lounge drum. <laughs> That's what they called it. Wow. It was another single-headed tall drum. So that was the first time we saw that from Ludwig, and it had the snare mechanism in it. Um, they also, Ludwig came out with this one they called the Las Vegas Club Drum. And that was a 16-inch double-headed cocktail drum. So again, a tall drum, but it was 16 inches in diameter. And it had a snare mount that attached to the side of this 16 inch standing drum and held a 13 inch snare. Wow, man. So, um, again, that was their sort of version of, of things. Yeah. Um, Ludwig also in that same year, 59, came out with the Speedmaster pedal, which was also reversible. Hmm. Um, it, a much simpler pedal. You actually, the, uh, it has a leather strap and it attaches to a post. And all you do is undo the wing nut for the post pull it out and flip it around to the other side of the pedal and put it in. You, you can reverse those things in five seconds. Um, cool. they're, they're not the strongest pedals there, but they're, you know, they're easy, easy to play and lightweight, yeah. good, good for carrying around. I love the, um, on your website again, I love the Las Vegas club, the Ludwig, the page for the ad here where it's just like Las Vegas and it's got, it's yeah. like glowing and there's like the, the outline of a woman standing up playing, wearing a dress um, and just to read this here, it says with like the little kind of description next to it says with this complete drum set, you can stand up and play ideal for entertainers, singers, comedians, and master of ceremonies, full snare drum and hi-hat effects, plus ride cymbal holder and bass drum beat symbols, not included in the price, but extra according to selection. That's interesting because yeah, I mean, I guess if you're a singer or a comedian, I can't really imagine a comedian like you know, here I'm, I'm, I'm here to do some comedy. Let me bring my cocktail drum set, but that's an interesting take on it. You know, well, if, if, if someone wants to do their own, but <laughs> you know, I, I bet you somebody did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, a really interesting thing in the, in the fifties, I've seen a lot of pictures. Um, and again, there's a bunch on the site there. There's actually a photo gallery, um, that has a bunch of things in there as well. But there, uh, there's one person there, Lynn page, I believe her name is that, uh, one of the people, you know, members of the community sent me these pictures and he's like, this is my mom. Whoa, she was cool. a singer, a lounge singer, and she played with these little combos and the pictures of the band and her, and she's holding sticks and there's a cocktail drum in front of her. And mm. she told him like, yeah, I used to play the cocktail drum and, you know, would do jam sessions and these things. And I, I think that um, a lot of people would have these little combos, you know, say, you know, piano, bass, and a singer. And they just say, well, can you play some drums? Here, have a cocktail drum. It, it's not too loud and it looks cool and it adds a little percussion That's interesting. to what's going on. So I think there, there was a lot of that as well. And certainly the, the showiness of it, I think was, was a real attraction for, for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'll mention that the, so there was the school of musical performance where I got my first cocktail drum 
And then later he had another one because he knew I was into the cocktail drum. So he let me know. And there was a store two blocks away from him where I got another one, basically a mint <laughs> gold sparkle Slingerland awesome. kit. And basically after talking with a bunch of the guys down there, they just said, yeah, you know, they, they were blocks away from Coney Island. And they said all the hawkers in Coney Island would have these things for that, you know, step right up, pop, yeah. you know, or, and you know, they, they don't have stages there. They don't have backstages. They just have these little planks to stand on. So it was kind of the ideal thing, uh, you know, way to kind of spice things up, make a little bit of noise and try and attract people to your booth. That's so cool. That makes perfect sense. That's, that's the kind of stuff that I love with this of like, you know, yes, it's cool. I love going through the catalogs, but I like hearing about the people who would be using them you know, out on the street and the purpose of having this like kind of fold up all in one drum set, which, you know, portability is a big thing, which goes back to, you know, to the beginning of the drum set where guys are jumping on street cars and they're the, the, the collapsible bass drums and all that stuff. There's, there's been a, a quest for, I feel like it's kind of died down a little bit now where it's not as important because you're not being like, you know, in a horse drawn carriage or something, but like, um, where, Portability is huge with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely carried my cocktail drum to a gig on the subway many, many, many times. That's awesome. Um, and if it if it's the basic setup, just the drum and a cymbal, I can carry it. You know, I, I used to live about eight blocks from the subway station. I could carry it no problem. <laughs> with cocktail angst, I had all the extra stuff, so I just have a little hand dolly, and you know, save myself that pain. And but it, not great. not too bad. No, you know. No, another benefit. Okay, so yeah, so that's the fifties, right? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, you know, I can I can blast through the rest because so things didn't change too much after this point, except uh, there was one new addition, and let's see, uh, it was in sixty three. Both Slingerland and Ludwig, and and this was not in their sixty two catalogs. Uh, but in 63, both Singerland and Ludwig came out with drums that were a small bass drum, which instead of a tom, they had a mount with a snare basket and a snare on top. So it was yeah. a separate kick drum and snare drum, but the snare drum basket was mounted on top of the kick drum. Mm. Uh, the Slingerland was a 16 by 16 kick, obviously built out of a floor tom with a 14 inch snare. And the Ludwig one called the Gold Coast was an 18-inch kick with a 13-inch snare on top. Man, that's so cool. I think that's so genius. And you explained it really well, but just to like, in case someone out there is, is not on the website or looking, so basically just imagine your regular bass drum and then where your tom mount is, which I imagine it's basically the same size. You could probably use this bass drum and switch it out and um, put a time mount in. But okay, so your bass drum and then... To, you know where your the hole for your tom mount there's just a you know a portion of a snare stand coming out of it and the snare is on top of the bass drum all connected um which is such a cool idea um i guess there's no real do you see that there's a benefit to having one way or the other or is they are they both kind of unique in their own way yeah well i think i think they did this because some people probably were getting frustrated that they couldn't make the single drum sound like a separate kick drum and a snare sure. drum, you know, and, and this way they at least could do that. You really had the two separate instruments, but it still was designed to take up a relatively small amount of space and, and to be played standing up. Yeah. The mount was pulled forward towards the drummer just to, so that the snare could be close enough sure. to be played standing up. Yeah. It's also interesting to note that in 63, both Ludwig and Slingerland came out with basically the same technology where they have historically like a feud of like it's this battle between the two of them of like, you know, the, the age old story of like sneaking into the garbage and stealing stuff to see what they were working on. So kind of interesting how like, you know, in the same year they came out with this same technology. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm, I'm sure it was highly competitive. You know, I think all these things, kind of took because someone said, oh, well, that could be cool. We, we should get in on that before it explodes. Yeah. But I, I really don't know how much cocktail drums exploded. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think there were a lot out there. Again, I, I think they were mostly show pieces. Um, 
and you know probably were used for exactly that you know i bet a lot of small lounges just had them there you know just like now everybody's got a you know a cheap pearl kit at their club sure you know they probably just had a drum a cocktail drum there just in case yeah for whoever was showing up to to use it absolutely and and this is another one of those things where you know i'll say it but i don't know i can't remember the exact um oh god i feel like I, I can't remember where i saw it um a vintage japanese cocktail drum that i think was oh here i found it right here just looking um it, it was the midget which again is not the greatest word to use, but um, cocktail drum kit. I guess that was uh, Kingstone Starfield drums from in the 1970s. I'm seeing this on star-drums.de. Yeah, certainly. You know, there there were so many uh, Japanese companies that were basically making the identical products as as all the American companies. So yeah, yeah they're definitely. I've seen several cocktail drums from the Japanese manufacturers from the 60s. Yeah. Cool. Of course, they, uh, I, which is just cool because again, you know, if you can't afford the Ludwig, you could buy this. And even even today, it's like these are probably more expensive than your average, you know, um, MIJ drum set because they're they're more rare. But um, I mean, they, they, you know, it's still it's a, a different era of wood. Yeah. Even if it wasn't the same quality as some of the American stuff, the the quality of the wood and the craftsmanship is often phenomenal compared yeah. to what you get for the same price today. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I like how you said before, which is interesting about how in the 60s, not much changed after that, which kind of like, this is another theme that happens on the show too, where you kind of hit like the 80s or something. And it's like, well, that's pretty much when it stopped changing. But um, so they're, they're obviously included in catalogs. Like it's still like a, a staple of drum catalogs, what looks like for the next couple, the next decade or so, right? They're still relatively popular. Uh, I think, uh, let me, well, sorry, I may have to actually look, but, uh, I believe 63 was the last appearance of the cocktail drum in the Slingerland and Ludwig catalogs. Hmm. It certainly was around that. Basically the, the way I always describe it is by the seventies, nobody wanted these things. <laughs> um, Jeez. yeah, here we go. I, I have, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. There is a, a 73, um, so Slingerland and their 73 was the last catalog with, okay. with cocktail drums. And they had both the, uh, the cocktail outfit. Uh, that one's called number two, eight, six. That's the one with the 16 inch kick and the snare drum on top. And then they did have the regular 14 inch drum with the, the, uh, upward hitting pedal. And they still had the single headed cocktail drum at that point too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 73, uh, Gretsch 70 was the last catalog that they had. So, you know, I think by the, by the 70s, they really were dying out. You know, rock and roll was becoming king. These were not sexy rock and roll drums. They were small, weird, flat sounding uh, weirdo drums. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, they, they're, I think people probably still associated them with like lounge jazz, which was, was quickly losing steam. Yeah, but that's where, so I'm kind of just like thinking now, like, so obviously the term cocktail comes from that, like lounge jazz, like uh, Las Vegas, you know, performers, like standing up kind of playing. That's where that cocktail term uh, for the drum set comes from. And I, and I know you said it just sort of like it caught on and it popularized and that became the name just probably in like the culture of like you know, yeah, grab the, grab the cocktail drums. Some one guy probably said it and it probably spread, but, um, right. That makes sense that, that, that name went with that style, which like you said, kind of went away. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think it was a small drum for playing in a small cocktail lounge mm -hmm. where you couldn't bring in a full big kit. It was a small, small combo playing quietly. So it was kind of the perfect thing. I mean, these days I, I see people calling a lot of the mini kits, cocktail drums, for that same reason, it's just a small kit for playing at a, at a cocktail party or in a cocktail lounge and maybe yeah. it's a small kit with a 16 inch bass drum or something. And yeah, um, but, but not what, not what I would call a cocktail drum. I, I was thinking of it as kind of a, a thing. <laughs> yeah. Like you have to stand up. I would agree where I've seen it, where it's like, like, like that's like almost like a club kit or something, yeah. but like, yeah. let's keep cocktail drums 
you know, what they should be. This is our, our call to action of <laughs> <laughs> call it what it is, but, um, all right. And then this is, uh, like side note. So there was a while where I was like in, I forget, I didn't, I had no reason to have it. I was playing in bands and stuff, but I had no reason to have it, but I know, and they may not even, um, make it anymore, but I know groove percussion, um, which I think was like, I think I was looking at it on like on Walmart's website or something, but I'm sure it's not very nice, but I know you can get a GP, you know, groove percussion cocktail kit for like 300 bucks, which yep. I know that that's not the most, that's like us being like, you know, go buy like a percussion plus kit or whatever, you know, just like a no brand name drum set, but kind of cool that you can get a cocktail kit for that cheap. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's basically, you know, how cocktail drums started coming back, you know, in the 90s, you know, drum and bass, jungle music, you know, people were really starting to do mini kits and figuring out how to get really good sounds out of small drums. And I think just some of the people out there remembered the cocktail drum and said, hey, you know, this is basically the same thing. And uh, yeah, there, you know, there are a few of the cheaper ones, GP, uh, HB, HB drums. Mm. Um, I mean, even Trixon, although the, those came a little bit later, uh, the, but the Trixon ones are actually surprisingly well made for the price. Uh, they're not too expensive. Um, you know, the big one that came out was the Yamaha Club Jordan, which I was trying to find the year. I think it was 2011 that that one really came out. Cool. And that is a full, full out pro, beautifully made instrument um yeah that's and awesome. they had the the snare on the side you know they had the little eight inch popcorn snare hmm. and a 10 inch tom and then a lot of companies just took that model and ran with it uh so i think that's what the Trixon is based on um then a bunch of the custom drum makers got into it as well uh Stauffer and treehouse drums um this guy billy blast makes a bunch cnc i uh, i know that you had an interview with uh Dune. They they made a really beautiful stainless single drum. Cool, yeah. And you see a lot of like like I'm looking at uh, the Tama cocktail jam. You see a lot of them now where like I feel like like you know the rules have gone out the window. Like you can they can look however they want. Like they're very modular and the hardware has gone to the point where they're like divided up. And um, I feel like cajones are a very uh, hot topic in the drum world where some people love them and some people hate them, but like where you could incorporate a cajon with like a pedal that's almost like a remote pedal that's going over here and playing it. Um, so it's um, it's really the, the an exciting time for the world of like, you know, stand up drum kits, which is kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the I at this point, I would call the, you know, the the Tama cocktail jam I I could call that a cocktail drum set. <laughs> it has the upward hitting pedal <laughs> yeah you know those those are the two the two things to me is that the that a, a pedal is hitting the bottom of a drum and or you're standing up to play it um you know the those yeah. seem to be the two things I I just call those ones floor tom based cocktail drums okay. and and it's basically uh, you know I mean it's what's funny is it's basically the Rogers Park Lane. Sure. That, that's what they've done. They've modernized the Rogers Park Lane, which is from 1951, which is crazy. You know, here it, it is. is 60 plus years later. And, and they're just kind of doing the same thing, just but with improved hardware. And, you know, they have they have a gap, you know, air gap in the middle, which I think helps the sound of the bass drum. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, there, there were a bunch. So, you know, right around 2000, I think the mini kit thing started spilling over into people experimenting with the cocktail drum things um a real quick rundown of you know what was there slingerland which you know at that point they were a completely different company they mm -hmm. were making terrible uh stuff through the 70s 80s 80s really 80s yeah, yeah. 90s 2000s um so they weren't great quality but they made a kit called the slingerland espresso which was based on a 16 inch floor tom same thing hanging off a small snare a small tom and cymbals with an upward hitting pedal uh, Peace Manhattan kit came out. Um, that one was the same basic concept, except they they sort of designed it so that the snare would stack on top of the floor tom. 
So you were, you were still playing a vertical drum, but it was still physically two separate drums. Gotcha. And actually, one of the Dune uh, stainless drums is like that too. They they actually rest the snare on top of the uh, kick drum. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then I think I mentioned the Kixon, uh, Trixon, which is like the Club Jordan, uh, the Yamaha Club Jordan, which the, the one cool thing about that is they made it a 15-inch main drum, which I appreciated because that sort of split the difference be- between this what, what feels to me as oversized 16-inch tall main drum, but it gave a little more oomph than a, a 14-inch, especially if you're using it as a floor tom and a kick drum. If you're not yeah. doing the snare. Um, sure. Man, also, I'm like, I'm like, I didn't, I mean, it's crazy because I've done the show now for so long, but I didn't know Trixum was still making drums as a company. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's still a different company. Basically. Just the name, um, maybe. Like, because I know Vox and they have the new, like, Speedfire kit. I think that's the right one I'm thinking of. But, um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I think, I think my memory was that there, there's a music store in Wisconsin, Labs Music which actually used to play a lot with one of the Lobs sons in Boston. Um, and I believe that they own the trademark for Trixon. It was, uh, I feel like it was something like that and that sure. they started manufacturing through a third party under the Trixon name. But but they are well-made drums. you mm. know. And, and again, the price point is pretty amazing if you're looking just to get a cocktail drum to get into it. They're they're very well made for the price. Yeah, like four um, four forty is the price exactly. of most of them. Yeah. So um, I would buy that before I bought a GP. Uh, no, no offense, GP, but <laughs> no, but G, I mean that's again like I always say, if you have a groove percussion kit, that's great. You do you. They're awesome to get you playing the drums. But these, I mean, Trixon has so much history. Groove yeah. percussion wasn't around in the you know sixties and um, yeah, so. And you'll just end up replacing the hardware on the GP stuff. That, exactly. That's that's the main thing. You'll you'll first thing you'll do is buy new heads, and then after six months to a year, you're going to want to replace your hardware. So you can avoid some of that if you uh, throw down for a tricks in. Yeah. Man. Okay. We're we're up to the modern stuff. I learned something new. I learned Trixon is uh, still a company, and on their website, they have kind of uh, digital snowflakes falling the entire time as you're on their <laughs> website, which is interesting. Nice. You don't. That's not. Uh, that's funny. You don't see that too often on uh, modern websites. But um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, John, now at this kind of, if there's anything else, throw it in there, any cool stories. But I'd love to maybe at this point, usually we kind of say, what are you up to? I know it's COVID, so you're probably up to nothing like the rest of us. But, um, you know, what's going on with you? Uh, gig wise, you know, all, all that good stuff. Where can people find you? That thing. Yeah. Um, so gig wise, it's, yes, it's very slow. Um, I actually live in Southern Maine now. I'm in South Berwick, Maine, which is near Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, moved up here a couple of years ago, uh, from Brooklyn. And, uh, there's an amazing bunch of musicians up here. So, you know, we, we are still actively working on music and occasionally playing, um, recently been subbing, this band called the the soggy po boys <laughs> which is kind of a new orleans yeah. jazz slash second line band really phenomenal and actually at the last gig i told them i was like next time i'm bringing the cocktail drum <laughs> because i think it's the perfect band for that actually cool um so next time i sub with them i will hopefully be doing it on cocktail drum nice um i also play in a, an instrumental heavy metal band called bassoon Nice. Like the instrument, and we're actually just finishing up um, our latest recording and some video stuff. So that should be uh, coming out early this, this next year. Um, very, very math heavy, and not cocktail drum oriented at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Which> is, man. <laughs> which is kind of like, funny. It's just funny to think of like a double bass pedal on a cocktail kit and just literally losing your balance and just yeah. not <laughs> being able to stand yeah. up. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how, how to do it, but, uh, you know, we'll that's going to take a little bit of time <laughs> yeah that'll take some thinking um yeah, yeah. um but yeah i also lead a, a uh, benny goodman swing band called flying home cool um I, I do a lot of music and drum transcription as well so that that's one of my kind of passion projects you know i, I just started transcribing the music because i love it and then had so many charts i got friends together and we formed a band so that's awesome um you know when non-covid times were, were usually pretty active in the area and then and then just some more experimental um jazz ish stuff um i'm in a band called shaman denominator it's a trio with 
drums, upright bass, and then a uh, trumpet player, keyboard player. Hmm. See, that and, sounds uh, like the metal band, Shaman Denominator. I mean, versus bassoon <laughs> sounds... <laughs> right. It, it's more more of a... Yeah, but Shaman, Shaman is... Uh, right, we, we do all kinds of stuff. I mean, we play cool. some standards, a lot of originals. We do interpretations of Bela Bartok material and Eric Satie and stuff like hmm. that. So it's... And some free improvisation stuff. Cool. And then also just play singer songwriters. I mean, I play bass as well. My wife, uh, Laura Cromwell, plays drums in a band with our friend Monica Cohen, who in a band called uh, Sifter. Nice. And that's more like singer songwriter stuff. And um, so that's not a drum thing, but Laura's a great drummer. So that's awesome. Love hearing her. Yeah, you got to shout the wife out, especially if she's a drummer. Um, oh yeah, yeah. That's no, and I'll, cool. I'll tell you my I'll tell you my early story because before we were going out, we we were you know, both drummers, we played a lot at the knitting factory in, in New York. So we, we knew each other, but not all that well. And I, I got the call from Laura saying, Hey, so I'm doing some gigs in the subway and I hear you have a cocktail drum. <laughs> you think, you think I could borrow that? And of course I'm you know, being incredibly protective and precious going, well, it's a vintage and I don't really like taking <laughs> it out. And, da, 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 da. Yeah. and of course I've, I've never lived that one down. <laughs> now, fortunately it still worked out and she can use my cocktail drum anytime she wants. Exactly. That's why she married you, right? <laughs> right. She had to marry me first. To use a cocktail drum. <laughs> Good. Very sneaky. Yeah. Man. Um, hey, I wanted if, if I can take a minute to just to give a shout out to people who i consider are sort of important in in my mind in the cocktail cocktail sure, drum world please um you know again my my perception of the cocktail drum is it's just a weirdo instrument that you know maybe had its moment in the sun as a weird gimmick but i feel like over time people have really embraced it as a strange experimental instrument and I think there are a lot of people who were trying to do it that probably didn't know what a cocktail drum was. So a few quick examples are um, a drummer named Ross Barber. He was the drummer and one of the singers in a band called the Four Freshmen, which was a male vocal group in the 50s. And he would perform. He had this weird custom rack. It almost looked like the base of a desk with a tabletop taken off. But it just had a snare drum and two cymbals. But he would stand up and play this thing and sing. Um, so again, cool. just just experimental drum setup. It was like I see it. And I'm like th- this guy had the first drum rack. Yeah, and that's basically what it was. Wow. Um, other people, Mo Tucker from the Velvet Underground. You know, she had her kick drum flipped on its side and played it with her hand. She didn't use her foot. I mean, mm-hmm. she she could, and sometimes she would, but a lot of times she would just play the kit. And just play a bass drum with her hand. That's awesome. um, I think she would sit, but I'll still give it to her because that was a really cool <laughs> thing to do. Sure. Um, Bill Conway was a drummer in a band called Treat Her Right, and then which later became Morphine. Um, he had a Ludwig cocktail drum, I think it was a 16, and he played that exclusively in Treat Her Right for a while. And then he did play it on some some morphine tracks as well. I don't know if you're familiar with that band, but they're an amazing band out of Boston in in the 80s and 90s. Well, morphine was in the 90s, and um, but he he did play the cocktail kit in Treat Her Right. There's some videos out there of him playing it. Um, cool. Very very cool. And he got he had the thing sounding great. I actually emailed with him a bunch when I first started the website, and he was really really great guy, really nice. Um, also, Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats. Yeah. Right, he kick and snare yeah. and a couple of cymbals, and I think later he threw a hi hat on the side. But you know, he he was doing it. He, he basically made his own version of the, you know, Ludwig Gold Coast. Yeah, and did that. Um, he's he's sim- who I think of a lot too with it in that world, and and it it just kind of like it's one of those things where, like you said, where like it just fits perfectly, and it's really a part of the sound. Um, yeah. like kind of that rockabilly sound it's kind of jangly and like it just it fits really well yeah and and those guys i mean they, they just broke everything because everyone was in hair bands you know <laughs> like at yeah. that point their metal, metal was the was king and here are these guys doing rockabilly and a weird guy standing up playing kick snare and a cymbal <laughs> like yeah. It, yeah. it was pretty pretty impressive Definitely. um yeah th- there's another band from canada called moxie fruvis that was around for the 90s um and he uh the 
I don't know how to pronounce his name, Ian, Gian, mm. with a J, uh, Gomeshi. Uh, he was the lead singer and played the drums, and he had a kick drum with a snare basket mount on top. I, I don't think it was a traditional, you know, Gold Coast, but I think he just made his own. That's um, cool. So anyway, he was doing that. Um, there's a woman, uh, Fuzuki, who played in a band, X-Girl, kind of a Japanese punk band. I, I don't know. Check them out. They're really amazing. Oh, yeah. And and she played just floor tom and snare. So it was always sticks. But she stood and played floor tom and snare and and just played the hell out of it. It was really, really great. Um, yeah, and then just more traditional people. Bernie Dressel played with the Brian Setzer band. Um, and he played a DW cocktail kit, um, kind of like the Club Jordan you know, I think he did that kind of as a tribute to the Stray Cats standing thing. Yeah. But uh, he's a phenomenal drummer and, you know, re- really played that thing beautifully. Mm. Um, Steve Jordan, who helped design the Yamaha Club Jordan. Uh, he was playing the Club Jordan with the John Meyer trio. There's a bunch of videos of that as well. And then you'll, you'll see him on all sorts of things playing that. And then uh, the last one who did a project with that that i know was peter erskine mm-hmm. uh, he had a band called the lounge art ensemble and the the first record he used the club jordan i think after that he went back to a, a traditional set but yeah that, that was a cool thing yeah absolutely. And, then, and then you just see them people do little cameos with them uh there's a video out there with mick fleetwood playing a club jordan there's a club jordan in uh austin the first austin powers movie <laughs> really um, with, Bert, with Bert Bacharach. oh yeah you know, he's playing that's awesome. Um, like on the top of the uh, double decker bus kind of thing there. Yeah, I think they're on a street for that for oh, the cool, scene that has cool. the cocktail drum. But um, <laughs> there's a guy, Dan Hicks, and the Hot Licks who've been around forever. He, he That was a funny one because he actually rented my cocktail drum because uh, they were on the Conan O'Brien show. Nice. And I got this weird call from his manager saying, hey, can we rent, rent your cocktail drum? We, we really want to use it. <laughs> That's awesome. So, he did, but uh, I, I thought that was very... Uh, innovative of him because it was kind of pre pre all the other cocktail drums he just thought it was a cool thing to have out front yeah man you know what's what's old is new and i'm sure they'll go through more iterations and changes and stuff they're they're always there in the you know like i said earlier like there's always you know most companies have them like yeah you can get a cocktail kit like it's like yeah it's on page 10 of the catalog and like the sixties, it's like there, we, we offer them like you, why not? You know, someone wants them and, um, it's just so cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think someone like you, who's doing a great, uh, service to them by again, having this website and, uh, spreading the knowledge like this, it's just, uh, it's what it's all about. And this is one of those things where like, I don't know why, like I have a list of episodes. It sometimes it takes me a while just to be like, all right, oh yeah, let me do the cocktail one. I Googled it and within five minutes I was like, Oh, I think this is the guy to talk to. Cocktaildrum.com. <laughs> I think John might meet, yeah. be who I want. So yeah. um Well, and I, I really you know, it's a communal effort. I started that website because I suddenly had a cocktail drum and there was no information about them anywhere. So my my first page had a picture of a cocktail drum and it just said Hey, if you know anything about these, please email me so I can build up a source of information, you know, on, on the website. And over time, over many years, you know, people joined in, jumped in, sent me pictures, you know, catalog scans, stories, helped make some of the articles about things. Uh, the site is long overdue for an overhaul, but, uh, but the info's there and it's good and, you know, hopefully people are enjoying it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the cool thing is like history like you have very um it's very like factual history of like this is the catalog this is the next thing where it's not like some crazy story or something being being thrown out there so it's not like the history is going to change but people can just add on to it so hey I mean if people out there are listening know something different about cocktail drums go to cocktaildrum.com and um check it out and john's info is on there and i'm sure he'd be happy to work with you and talk and add info to his website and all that good stuff Um, yeah please drop me a line i have a players page where i I post links to people who are actively playing cocktail drums and things like that so check that out because there are a lot of guys in europe that are doing a lot of rockabilly guys in europe in particular yeah um really love the cocktail drums 
Cool. All right, John. Well, um, on that note, I think that's a great uh, ending to the episode. So again, people can check out cocktaildrum.com and it's John Medham, who is the uh, the kind of the cocktail drum man. Um, so John, thank you for taking the time to be on the show with us and uh, sharing your knowledge. That's my pleasure. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.